Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. In 1606, British King James I granted the Virginia Company of London a charter. A year later, this privately funded joint stock company established the first permanent English colony in North America at Jamestown in the colony of Virginia. What did the company have to do to establish this colony? How much capital did it have to raise to support its colonial venture? And from whom did it raise this money? Historian Misha Ewan recounts the fascinating early history of the Virginia Company and its initial investors. So there was no English empire to speak of in this period, as we would later understand it. But there are attempts to establish permanent settlements in North America. Under Queen Elizabeth, she grants status patents to colonists to go and explore the east coast of North America. And in the 1580s, they established the Roanoke colony, which obviously fails. But during this period, there's also attempts at colonization in Ireland. And in fact, many of the men who have experience of colonization in Ireland later go and settle in North America. But there are other more informal attempts at overseas trade and colonization as we might think of it. There are trading companies trading in places as far apart as Russia and the East Indies and establishing trading factories in places like India. So there are these various different projects going on, but there is no permanent colony or settlement in the late 16th century. And it would be several more years before they're successful under the following reign of James I in the early 17th century. England was quite a small actor on the world stage. It's a Protestant nation, and I think they feel threatened by Spanish influence. And establishing a foothold in North America would give them a way both to have access to their own natural resources and trade and not have to rely on other European powers, but also try to assert their own influence with what they see, this growing Spanish Catholic influence, not only in Europe, but now also in the so-called New World. There are all these other cultural and economic and social reasons as well. In England at this time, there are concerns about underemployment and overpopulation. And increasingly, they see colonization as an outlet for some of these concerns. They think it will provide new jobs and opportunities, not only for the poor laboring classes, but also for the second sons of the gentry who are in search of their own opportunities for social advancement and wealth. So there are a mixture of different factors, but I think clearly they are being influenced by their European neighbours as well and looking to them and following their precedents. And I think that is one of the key reasons that increasingly North America and the Americas more generally seems like the best option for them. They think it's a land of plenty. They think it is rich in natural resources. And importantly, when they're looking to the east coast of North America in particular, that's an area that isn't yet claimed by another European nation. So it seems for the English that it's there waiting for them and very much open. Colonisation does require very deep pockets. And Queen Elizabeth and then King James after her do not have the capital to finance this. So instead, would-be English colonists in the 16th century and the early 17th centuries, they do seek crown approval and they're granted crown permission in the form of these letters, patents and these charters for trading companies. But what they really rely on is the capital of the nobility in England and the merchant population as well. And they're seeking this private investment through their own networks, much wider networks. So beyond the court, into merchant communities in the city of London, but also places like Plymouth and Bristol. So in this way, again, England is different from Spain. The Spanish state is incredibly wealthy at this time because of their expanding empire. And England just doesn't have the same resources to draw upon. And this is one of the reasons that we do have the development of these private trading companies in this period, because they need private wealth in order to fund these ventures. There is this ongoing contrast, I guess, between sort of crown influence and the creation of these private companies. And the Virginia Company is a joint stock company. This is a model which essentially is how we'd understand companies today with different shareholders. So although it's a smaller group of gentlemen who petitioned the crown for a charter to establish the Virginia Company, and they're granted this charter by James I in 1606, the company itself is made up of a much greater number of individuals who invest. 
So it gets its start in 1606 and originally is a smaller council of company directors and they're directing colonisation from England and there is also a council in Virginia. But a few years later in 1609, they kind of realise that this model isn't really working for them and the company opens up. They provide opportunities for a much broader public to invest in the company. So you have people from merchant backgrounds, people who are in trades, and we also have first women investing in the company as well. And what this model provides, it spreads the risk amongst many individuals. There's not one single person or it's not the crown who is sharing not only the financial risk, but the political and diplomatic risk as well. And this is appealing to people in England because they can invest £12 in a share But if things go wrong, it is only £12. They're not pouring in hundreds and hundreds of pounds as investors do in the East India Company, for example, which is quite an expensive company to invest in. And they spread this risk amongst themselves. So you have people who invest in groups, sometimes with colleagues or neighbours or other members of their family. And it's from this point onwards, really, that we see the membership of the company expand to include people from different social backgrounds and classes as well. Though that's not how they would have thought of it themselves at the time, but people who are in professions and trades, so members of livery companies, but also women from merchant backgrounds. And then the company gets a new charter in 1612. And at this point, we then see even more women coming into the company from noble backgrounds. And I think by this point, the company already has an increasingly well-oiled promotional campaign underway. They're seeking investment through the courts across the city of London and beyond and really trying to leverage the influence that they have. They have certain patrons who are helping them to do this. King James's son, Prince Henry, and also the king's right-hand man, the influential statesman, Robert Cecil. They both die in 1612. And, you know, after that point, the company does kind of have some trouble because it's taken a few years to get the project underway. They've not been particularly successful and they've just lost two of their greatest patrons. And at that point, some people do default on their payments to the company because they're losing confidence in it and its ability to actually succeed. It's a slow progress. But I think actually by having that kind of number of investors and some people who are willing to carry on pouring capital into it, willing to lend the company money on interest or also provide charitable payments to the company as well is really what helps it keep up the momentum over the next few years until it reaches a point that it has increasing stability and seems like permanent settlement is actually going to be a prospect. The benefit of a joint stock company, what this model provides is that you can seek investment from people that don't have any prior experience of colonisation and trade. And this is what is different and beneficial. So they can seek investment from people who do have money to give, but maybe have never invested in these kinds of projects before, because what they have is a small group of company directors who are experienced, who can oversee trade, but they give these shareholders a say in how policy is created and they have these meetings that everyone is able to attend and and voice their opinions and voice their concerns. So in some ways, it's a more democratic way of operating a company, I guess. Although that's not how they would have thought of it at the time. But it's different from regulated companies, which is the other model that the English use for other overseas trade. And those companies do rely on all of the members of the company being experienced merchants. Because the Virginia company doesn't rely on that model, that's why you do get all of these gentlemen at court who are investing and all of these noble women. And that's important because they are able to bring that kind of cultural and social capital to the company. They make it respectable. They bring their civility and their networks and their connections and patronage to the company, which is really important for its success and kind of lends it an air of respectability that, quite frankly, other trading companies in this period, they're seen as being spheres of merchants. The Virginia Company has this different feel to it for English people at the time. The East India Company was a joint stock company and there was also a joint stock company in the 16th century. But the Virginia Company is the first joint stock company which is attempting colonisation. In this period, the East India Company isn't looking to establish permanent colonies. Colonisation comes much later. So as a joint stock company which is establishing colonies, it is the first in England. And I think it's questionable how successful that was and whether it was the right model. 
clearly people in England eventually decided that that wasn't the best way to model colonisation. But in 1606, there was a precedent for it. And actually, many of the people who were involved in the East India Company, which received its charter just six years before, also invested in the Virginia Company. So there's that kind of shared experience and shared practice there, sort of in the community of merchants and nobility in London who are looking both to North America and looking eastwards to India and the East Indies as well. Next time, we continue our expose on the colony of Jamestown. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. Thank <laughs> you.